Hi friends, today we're doing a sit down video. We haven't done one of these in a while and what I really wanted to do was go through my master's thesis because everyone always asks me what did I do, what was my topic on, and I feel like I should just address it, make a full video about it, and then put it in the past. Before we get started, I want to say that this video is sponsored by Dev Mountain. And if you don't know, Dev Mountain is a coding school. They teach tons of different development for web, for iOS, and they have many different locations in the States. You can check them out in the link in my description. Thank you to Dev Mountain for sponsoring this video. Boom, so fast, getting really good at that. Okay, so going directly into my master's thesis. Basically, I'm kind of kind of give you the introduction of my master's thesis, which explains kind of everything. We all know that renewable energies are gaining a lot of traction and they're gaining a lot of funding and government subsidies because we're pushing for renewables. But if you know anything about renewables, you also know that they're very sporadic. For example, you only get electricity from solar panels when they can be charged with sunlight. So that's when there's no clouds, when it's sunny outside, so not at night, etc, etc. For wind power, it's very sporadic. You could have, you know, wind turbines spinning all the time and then as soon as there's no wind, your turbines finish. So renewable energy fluctuates a lot. So despite our push for renewables, we're still going to continue burning fossil fuels. That's just the way it is. Right now we don't have a better solution. So now looking at fossil fuels, particularly looking at natural gas, which is not coal. I personally believe we should all move away from coal. Coal is not very good. So let's talk about natural gas. <laughs> We're going to need to continue to burn fossil fuels in order to meet consumers energy demand. When wind is not functioning and we can't get energy from renewables, we're going to need to start up some gas turbines quickly to keep that energy demand constant for, you know, everyone, everyone that's trying to watch Netflix or cook and use their dishwasher or whatever, we're going to need to meet that energy demand. So a new novel combustion system that burns natural gas is called a sequential combustor. So if you look at your PV thermodynamics diagram, basically a normal combustor pumps in fuel, burns the fuel, and then releases that fuel. It spins the turbine when the fuel expands and then the turbine generates electricity. So a sequential combustor, what it does is that instead of releasing that fuel, air, burnt combustion mixture after it combusts, that mixture is still hot. And the thing is that heat contains a form of energy, or heat is a form of energy. It's the lowest grade form of energy because it's the hardest to convert to electricity or whatever. What the sequential combustor does is it takes that heat from the combustion process and squirts in a little bit more fuel, a little bit more air, and then it combusts again. It, there, it, there doesn't even need to be a spark or anything because the fuel air mixture is so hot from the first stage that if you just squirt in a little bit more fuel, a little bit more air, it combusts. So then you have two flames in one gas turbine. Now this is state of the art newest form of technology for gas turbine combustion systems. And the reason it's great is because it's has super high operational and fuel flexibility and it's more efficient so it can burn fuel more efficiently. Now in the gas turbine industry, usually what you want to do is you want to burn fuel at the super lean regime. You don't want to be wasting fuel when you can just squirt in a little bit of fuel and get out the power that you want. But the problem when you go to the fuel lean regime, right now my hands are doing the equivalence ratio versus temperature diagram. If you have an equivalence ratio of one, which basically means you have this perfect amount of fuel for the amount of air you have, and together if in a perfect world, if they mixed, you would get CO2 in water and you wouldn't get any, and nitrogen, and you wouldn't get any other byproducts. So in a perfect world, burning at an equivalence ratio of one would give you no other byproducts, no other like NOx, but that doesn't happen. You always have some sort of byproducts. So what gas turbine companies do is they actually burn in a fuel lean regime. So they have a lot of air and they just squirt in a little bit of fuel. Why do they do this? Because they don't want to waste fuel. They don't want to burn up all the fuel and they want to still generate electricity. So that's why they do it. 
The problem is that when you go to this fuel lean regime, you have a little bit of fuel for a lot of air. So when you're trying to mix that fuel into the air, you don't get a homogeneous mixture before you burn. That's why a lot of companies, you know, spend a lot of time looking into different mixing methods. Like this is a big field of research. Getting the perfect mixture of fuel and air is essential. And when you have a little bit of fuel for a lot of air makes it more difficult to get this perfect mixture. Now, why do we want this perfect mixture? Don't worry, I'm getting to my thesis project. This is all ties in. Why do you want this perfect homogeneous mixture? So if you don't have a homogeneous mixture of like this amount of fuel, like let's say one part fuel to 10 part air, if you don't have this homogeneous mixture everywhere, you're gonna have some parts of your fuel that have more fuel than air, that have half fuel, half air, that have no fuel at all. And when this happens, when you when those little pieces of the mixture arrive to your flame front, what happens is that certain parts of that mixture are gonna burn hotter than other parts because the closer you go to an equivalence ratio of one, the hotter your flame will be. So when I'm talking about the equivalence ratio of one, again, I'm talking about that perfect stoichiometric mixture of the perfect amount of fuel and the perfect amount of air that give you only CO2 and water at the end of your combustion. So if you have an inhomogeneous mixture that reaches your flame front and parts of the fuel are burning hotter than other parts of the fuel, you have a flame that's burning and that is different temperatures at different parts of the flame. So you have your inhomogeneous mixture coming up to the flame front and now the flame is not the same temperature at every part. Why is that a problem? So if you go to your ideal gas equation, you know, PV equals NRT, the higher temperature you have, the more pressure you have. The higher temperature the flame is releasing in certain areas, the higher pressure the flame is releasing in certain areas. So now you have this different pressure fluctuations. So having pressure fluctuations inside a gas turbine is dangerous because these pressure fluctuations are kind of like vibrations and they can couple with the geometry and material properties of the gas turbine and cause a feedback loop and then these vibrations can spiral out of control and in the most dangerous and serious cases the gas turbine can crack its components can crack and explode so that's why it's really important to minimize the vibrations and especially you want to make sure that the modes of the gas turbine so you'll notice that there are different frequency ranges that you know if there's some sort of inhomogeneity inside of the flame and if it starts you know vibrating at a certain frequency the gas turbine can start vibrating at a certain frequency maybe that's 50 hertz maybe that's 200 hertz maybe that's however many you know 2000 hertz whatever you do not want to activate any of these natural frequencies of the combustion engine this is like I guess maybe I, I feel like I'm being clear. <laughs> if I'm not being clear, let me know. You know, there are natural frequency modes. If you have a string this long, it will have a natural frequency of like two nodes, one half a wave. You can do it in a way that it has two nodes. Or if you have a strong string this long, it'll be a different frequency. And so that's the same thing with gas turbine engines is that based on their geometry and their material properties and their size, they will have different natural frequencies and these frequencies can be activated based on what the flame is doing. So that's what I was doing for my master's thesis. So this is called thermoacoustic coupling. Okay, now you learn something new. Now, thermoacoustic coupling basically is not really looked at in many cases. The biggest field where it was investigated was rocket engines. So in the past, rocket engines they would discover that they would explode and they couldn't figure out why so for example for the apollo 11 their engine was the saturn 5 f1 now this engine had undergone 3200 full-scale tests and 2000 of those full-scale tests were dedicated to solving the problem of thermoacoustics so it's a big problem and it was mainly investigated in 
you know, rocket engines, but doing so many tests is super expensive, especially for small companies or gas turbine companies or whatever. Doing these tests is expensive. You can't in this day and age rebuild and do uh, tests on a gas turbine or on rocket engines 3,000 times. What we do now is we use computers. So that's what I actually did in my master's thesis. What I did was I used CFD program, or it's not really a program, it's like, <laughs> it was just a numerical solver. So I used a numerical solver called uh, AVBP and it's not commercially available, so you can't get it. <laughs> Basically, I used this numerical solver and I created a mesh of not a real gas turbine, but of like the test burner we have in our lab. And I investigated thermoacoustics on this burner. And the way I was doing that was that I was imposing an excitation in the first flame, and then I was looking at what happened with the, in the dynamics between the two flames, if the pumping of the first flame affected the second flame or not. So that's what I did. I hope this was informative. If you have any questions on my thesis, you can ask them below. If you would like my master's thesis, you can enter your email at the form below and I will email you my master's thesis and then you could read through it. There are probably mistakes. I don't want to know if there are mistakes, okay? Like, I don't care. It's submitted. It's done. Don't email me back if I have mistakes. I also, my supervisor was a PhD student and to, I also, like, my work fed into his work and together we published a journal article. If you would like access to that journal article and to my master's thesis, you just enter your email in the form below and I will send that to you. Last thing is a we're doing a live stream on February 11th or 13th. I'm not even sure anymore. Again, it'll be an AMA. I'll probably get some cake and eat cake while I answer your questions. Basically, I just want to hang out. I'm going to be in a new apartment by then. So this week has been really stressful because I'm trying to pack. Here, I'll just show you. I'm trying to pack up all of my crap. So here we can see I have this like my bags of clothes. Well, actually, this is just a full bag of shoes all of my clothes fit in there. This is clothes that I can't figure out what to do with them. And then, yeah, I guess I have like an entire kayak right there. That's like my toiletries. And then my aloe plants, my lovely aloe plants. I hope you liked this video. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up. If you wanna see more, please subscribe. If you have any questions about my master's thesis, leave them in the comments below.